Hello again, you're watching The K Burley Show. I'm so excited about our next guest. Who could forget this image? You remember where, what you were when you saw it, weren't you? Climbers back to back, queued in a traffic jam on the edge of Mount Everest. Well, the man who took that iconic image, an Everest veteran and multiple record holder, is with us here in the studio, Explorer. Uh, Nomal Pojo, better known as NIMS, is attempting to climb 14 mountains, which are all higher than 8,000 metres in just seven months. He's already summited 11, including three peaks, which he reached in just over 48 hours. He's going to tell us all about it with us now. Hello. Hi. How are you? Met you for the first time last night. I was a little bit in awe. My goodness me. Good. Tell me all about it. You, you sold your house to, do, to get involved with this project, didn't you? Tell me from the beginning. Um... So basically, I had never planned to climb all the 14 peaks, you know, in such a short time at all, and, and I wouldn't even dare to do this. Um, the whole of the idea came, you know, when I was, um, I was on Everest in 2017 as one of the lead instructor for the Gurkhas. This was the second time the Gurkhas were trying to climb Everest in order to celebrate 200 years of you know, service to the British Crown and the country. So. What happened? You were that's... a Gurkha for the British Army. <clears throat> yes. So, and in the special services. Yes, so I served six years with the Gurkhas. Then I was with the special forces for ten years. So what happened at that point on Everest is normally uh, an official team take the responsibility of setting the fixed lines to the summit. So that season it didn't really happen, and um, the season was almost over, and there was no progress uh, with the fixing lines to the summit. So then. What it means for, for us, uh, anyway, was one, you know, when you say you are a Gurkha, everybody thinks that, you know, Everest is in your back garden. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, people will say, oh, yeah, you know, it's in your back garden and you didn't even summit and you are Gurkha. And, and that, that was a bit of reputation lyrics. And the second one was, this was the second time that the, the Gurkhas were on Everest. And um, certainly I thought, you know, whenever you'll get the second chance to climb Everest, you know, of course, you know, using the British taxpayers' money. So those were the risks. So I came with the plan that I would go and lead the fixing team, um, which went very successful. We were the first to summit from the, from the southern side. Immediate after that, you know, a remainder of the Gurkha team came in and summited. So 13, you know, British soldiers summited on, uh, um, on Everest in 2017. After that, I came back to Kathmandu. Um, obviously, we had a big celebration. We partied for a few few days, and uh... last night you were talking a lot about partying. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you like to party when you back down. Well, I think uh, yeah, that's who I am. You know, try to enjoy a bit when you can, and so yeah. So from Kathmandu, I went back again on Everest, and um, then I summited Everest again. Then I summited Lhotse, which is the world's fourth highest mountain, and summited uh, Makalu, which is the world's fifth highest mountain. And I did everything that within five days, and again, <laughs> stopping for two nights for a partying. So, unbelievable. yeah. Unbelievable. So at that point, I realized I have got so much to give uh, into this mountaineering world. Um, hence why, you know, I came with uh, with this Project Possible idea. Um, for this, of course, you know, I had to sacrifice my job within the Special Forces. Uh, I had only six years to be entitled for the full pension. Um, but again, you know, I never joined the Special Forces for the money. It was pure, you know, I wanted it from here and here. Yeah. So, and this project, exactly the same thing. So you were six thing. years away from your pension, but you thought, don't want to do that, I love the mountains. Yeah, I just, well, I just say yeah, I love the mountains, but I also wanted to break this speed world records, um, you know, in order to, one, establish a paradigm shift in perception of human potential. Two, you know, basically, most of the climbers from Nepal are called the Serpas, you know, they have been, the, the frontier of, um, of 8,000 uh, since the, this uh, kind of an expedition started, but I felt like they never got the credit. So this is to bring that up, and I also support two charities. Uh, one is, you know, called Surachuri, which um, support um, the children in Nepal. They have been, you know, kind of, you know, rescued from trafficking and all. Um, and another one is, is um, I support the, the British um, military charity, um, as you know, that um, have been on war for, you know, obviously so many years. Mm. Unfortunately, some of us, you know, who went to war doesn't come home in the same way we left the country. So, yeah, and then uh, and I'm also supporting the, um, the, the, the climate change with the global warming. And that's purely because a few years back when people talk about it, I didn't really believe it, mm. um, if I'm honest. But 2018, 
I was on Amadablum. Amadablum is one of the most technical mountain. So this was the second time I'm there. I was on 2014 as well. 2014, we could uh, melt the snow at Cam One and obviously cook food and stuff. But when I was there last year, we had to carry gallons of water. And when you had to carry that heavy no kind of stuff, no it snow was, snow. yeah, yeah, there was no snow. So then I realized, okay, this is real. So uh, I'm trying to raise the awareness about it. So you climbed three in 48 hours? <clears throat> so I climbed Everest, let's say, and Makalu within 48 hours. Unbelievable. I was trying to break my own previous record, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. You managed it? Yeah, it was a challenge. It. Then what did you do? Because when I was in the Alps, I heard that you were climbing, was it K2? Yes. And yeah. it was a really dangerous climb yeah. because of the conditions. People so, didn't think that you would be able to do it, but you mm, did. Tell me about it. So um, K2, obviously, you know, I was on G1, G2, and I knew that 90% of the climbers had given on K2 this year. Mm. And those who were waiting at the... Why had they given up? <clears throat> so it was big, you know, kind of an avalanche risk. And, yeah. uh, so what happened was there were two kind of, you know, like different big commercial companies trying to set the fixed lines. Um, the first uh, one became unsuccessful because the avalanche came and took two of the lead climbers. Uh, and the second guys, again, exactly, they went over there. And, um, and for me, when I came into the base camp, I look at the videos and it was, it was scary. And um, I think this was the first time ever in my life where I had doubted my ability. Um, and um, and I was I was quite concerned about it. Um, and some of the good mountains that I respect from my heart, they had given up, and I had seen the videos. And also, <clears throat> but what it put me to go through this uh, challenge is um, challenge is um, you know when you go into special forces selection, you know roughly you know like there will be two hundred men you know going for the selection. Sometimes you know like ten people make it or eleven people make it. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to those 190 who have failed, you will never go for the selection. It's always going to be sound, you know, big and all. So I put that negativeness away, stayed positive, and eventually, yeah, we we opened the route for for everybody else on K2. So yeah. Unbelievable. Seriously, I keep saying unbelievable. I can't think of anything else to say because it truly is. It truly is. You are you are a mountain among men, if, you, if you'll forgive me. So talk to me about what happened <clears throat> after that, after K2. So was I, K2 when you carried out the rescue? Well? No, I carried the, I have done four rescues. So the first rescue was Annapurna, uh, which was Mr. Chin. So basically he was, um, you know, he was disappeared. He was reported to be disappeared for more than 36 hours. Uh, I was at the base camp. Um, and just to, just to be completely honest, uh, I you thought he was dead, didn't you? Yeah, we thought he was dead. And, and we got to the base camp and a few friends were waiting over there. I came about 10 p.m. We had a few whiskey, you know, we, we, we celebrated anyway. And then um, we went to bed about 3.30 in the morning. Then 6 o'clock, there's, there's a helicopter coming around. And they say, one Sherpa came into my tent and said, like, Nims, you need to come out. And I was like, what? What happened? He's like, apparently Mr. Chin is alive. I was like, what? Um, anyway, long story short, uh, we started obviously ramping and then you know, it was my team who said we're going to go in and do the rescue. Um, so just to put into the context, we were get dropped on a long line at uh, just below Camp 3. From where we were dropped to where he was on the summit day when we were fixing lines, it took us more than 18 hours. But when we were rescuing him, we covered that distance in four hours. From 18 so, hours to four hours, because you yeah. knew you needed to get there quickly. Quickly, and you know, everything what you know, I do in life, we, we give 100%, and we knew that, you know, he was in trouble. Um, what happened when you got and, there? Uh, so we got over there, and, um, you know, first question was like, OK, you know, we are was here he to conscious? save him. And I said, how many of you can you see us? And he said, four. And I was like, OK, he's conscious. Then he said, water. And we just give him a bit of sip of water, straight put him into oxygen, and started carrying the, the the rescue, and the rescue was successful. We did brought him alive to Kathmandu, but um, unfortunately, um, he passed away in his home country. Mm. Um, but you did everything you could on the mountainside to try yeah. to bring him home safely. You've you've um, summited <clears throat> eleven of the fourteen yeah. mountains already. In uh, yes, eleven of the of the fourteen in ninety three days. We have got four months now to do the rest of the three. Um, still struggling from the fund. I think the biggest uh, problem for, for this project, uh, Bremen Project Possible, was the funding, uh, purely because 
it was super hard. You know, I came from the Special Forces background. Nobody knew who was Nims. Even though I had three world records before coming, you know, saying that I would do this, it was hard. People would ask, you know, how many followers you have on this, that, that. It was crazy. And then for me, I couldn't just give up. Um, so last four months where I had planned to train for this, um, you know, this giant expedition, I was busy. My normal routine was four o'clock wake up, try to do this Instagram crazy post. After that, in a seven o'clock train to London, three, four meetings, back home about 7 p.m., dinner, and then follow-up emails, never been bed before midnight. And it was like that for pretty much four months. And uh, you know, when you are in special forces, you do handle the stress really well, you know? You do handle the situation where you are put into stress in a, in, in a situation, in the operations, you know? Never been phased out by that. But for the fundraising, I still remember I was driving an M3 uh, towards, you know, one of the meeting and uh, it, I was just, you know, emotional less. And I had just tears coming through my eyes. I just had to pull off, uh, come off the M3 and, um, and I started again, you know. Yeah, Nims get a grip, you know. So come back again and I crack on. And it's, it's been epic, the whole journey. Well, behind every uh, great man, of course, there is a woman who supports him. I'm, I'm hoping that your <laughs> missus will come and talk to us after the break. If not, we'll talk in a bit more detail uh, yeah. about the final three mountains that you're going to summit to uh, break this world record. Uh, why don't you stay tuned and uh, find out whether she joins us or not? And the last phase, how did you decide how to split them up? Uh, it's just all about looking where the mountains are, the yeah. weather conditions and all. So what I would say is, um, uh, so you can ask me, like, you know, like, because no one has climbed all the, all the mountains, like five mountains in Pakistan, mm. uh, in one season. And I'm the first ever person to do it. So I'll probably bring that and I'll, I'll just you know, tell us about the second phase and I'll, I'll bring that up. Sure, of course. Okay? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Perfect. How long have we got after the break? <coughs> so we've got another. about you guys being here. I've never had so many messages <laughs> from people. Everybody's setting their alarms if they weren't already. OK. So uh, before the break, we were talking to uh, Nims, the world famous mountaineer who's broken so many world records. But I was saying that obviously behind every great man, there is a, a woman who supports him. And Suchi was behind the scenes, was, didn't really fancy it. <laughs> Here she is. Fantastic. <laughs> Great to see you. I met you as well last night for the Lovely first time. And I was asking you how it feels when you're waiting for news. And you said to me that, <laughs> what did you say? I think it's just normal. <laughs> me, that's normal him. Um, but yeah, I'm extremely obviously proud of him, I must say. And obviously the past um, few months has been obviously very stressful as a family as well. So, but obviously I try not, try to obviously not stress as much 
as possible. I uh, try to keep myself busy. Obviously, I'm helping him with um, obviously the background admin and everything for the project as well. So keeping myself busy in that sense. And he always say, um, no news is good news. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> keep that in my head and try not to, you know. So if you've not heard from him, it's good news. It's so good news, heard from anyone else, it's good news. Yeah. <laughs> He's still on the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. You're, so you, you were telling me you've got... That you're, it's the first time ever that anyone's climbed all the major mountains in Pakistan in one season. Yeah, so I think um, we did the f in the first phase and second phase again. You know, the funding has always been the you know the hardest you know uh, I don't know the work of this project anyway. So uh, I was straight you know we, I finished the project straight into the work you know writing emails to everybody that I know then and obviously the crowdfunding and all. Um, and it was only like nearly about, I think, 10 days before I, I was about to fly to Kathmandu, sorry, to Pakistan. Um, Bremen stepped in and, and they covered the gap. Um, and obviously... And that was for the second phase? For the second yeah. phase. Um, and the third phase? Third phase is not funded at all. Um, and I hope... It, and if I'm to be honest, you know, Project Possible is not only my project and I have seen a lot of people from all over the world have supported this project. Um, and so what can people do if they to, to help support you? I think, um, well, the, we have the GoFundMe page. Um, they can obviously support from there. Um, they can also go into my Instagram and send the message if they can, um, which is on, on Nims Die and all. But I would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone who has been part of this project possible. Either you have donated 10 pounds, 20 pounds, or, or whatever, and then, um, and, and also like friends like Anne Middleton, you know, he's been one of the, the key sponsor um, alongside with Bremond's, everybody, you know, you all know who you are. Um, you know, I'm not just gonna keep, keep on telling the names, but as I say, you know, this is our project and, and I truly believe that if we all you know, unite, we can make this happen. Mm. It's nearly there. <laughs> yeah. And some of the headlines from what you're saying are that we really need to worry about climate change. Yes, yes. You're nodding. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, he talks to you about that, I'm guessing, when, when he's at home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, we obviously hadn't had much time uh, yeah. with each other, I would say. But, yeah, we have, obviously, the, like he mentioned earlier as well, about like how his experience was in one of the mountains where he could melt water and drink pre in previous years and things are changing. Mm. And, obviously, obviously every, every, everyone is affected by it. I would say the world is, so we need to... Um, do something to be aware yeah, of be that. aware at least yeah so you set off when so i will fly to nepal on uh 28th of this month oh soon, August soon yeah mm -hmm. and you're going to be away for hopefully um well i'll finish the project at mid-october but uh i'm working i'm guiding again in november uh, i'm taking the wreath on amadablam on 11 11. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is one of the most technical mountains. I would do that and uh, hopefully I'll come back. There well, for a bit wait, of rest. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an order. <laughs> most challenging mountain to climb? Um, most challenging yeah. mountain. I think uh, for me, there hasn't been such like, I know there are mountains in terms of technicals and all, but I think for me, the hardest has been like G1 purely because we had to cover eight days worth of trekking in three days and that's carrying our kit. Um, for more than you know, half of the journey, and straight away we got into the base camp, roll into you know, summit push. And honestly, for the first time, my legs were shivering when we were coming down from, from the summit of G1, because there was no ropes, nothing, and, uh, and I was just saying, Nims, not today. You just have to go back alive to tell this story, because people only know, you know the 5% of what I have been through, so. Mm. And your favorite mountain? My favorite mountain, okay. Um, I think K2 has been really nice. K2? So, yeah. Mm. And you did it in the snow and no one else had ever done it in yeah. summited in the snow. When you hear this stuff, you must think, oh, <laughs> my goodness, what is he doing? Yeah. So no was, one had ever done amazing. that before. Um, yeah, well, I think the previous record is nearly eight years and I'm trying to do this in seven months. Um, I've done three, sorry, 11 mountains in nearly three months now. It's possible, you know. Um, and the, so the previous record had been eight years and you're yeah. trying to do it in seven months. Seven months. What are you going to do once it's over? Well, have a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm not going to bring, but like I'll say, so K2 is the only mountain that remains unclimbed in winter. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, you know, big uh, and, and really good climbers are trying to bid for it. Um, I think I have to take the break this year. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, you know, I know when the climbers are going there this season, and if that doesn't happen, uh, I'm there next year. So Fantastic. yes. Okay, it's great to talk to both of you. Yeah. Be safe. Mm -hmm. I know that you will be, mm -hmm. and uh, come and talk to us when you're back from the other three mountains. Will it do. Will be great to see. And you. thank you so much for you know, having oh, us here. Oh, thank, thank you, and thanks for coming on. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up in just a few moments, Tammy Rand's ambassador to London saying the Grace One tanker will leave Gibraltar soon following its.